before we get into any real code, I really want to prepare your minds, prepare your minds for what we're going to be learning, why we're going to be learning this stuff, and really I think it also is going to help you get an understanding of the engineering decisions that go made. I, I always say that if you don't really agree with the engineering decisions of a language, you don't agree with those idioms, probably shouldn't be coding in that language because you're just going to be frustrated. And so I, I like talking about this stuff. So bear with me here, watch this stuff. I think it's going to give you a lot of good insight into what we're doing and why we're doing it and what this language is all about. So we're going to now start to prepare your mind. And, and one of the things that I, I love thinking about um, are these things, these four bullet points right here. Because somewhere along the line, somewhere along the line, we became impressed with programs that have really large amounts of code, large amounts of code, right? I, I mean, if you think about the Linux project, the, the Linux kernel, right now the Linux kernel's got well over 25 million lines of code in it. I, 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 I don't want to be working on a project that that's large. It's just, it's too difficult to wrap your head around, especially for one developer. We're going we're gonna to talk about lines of code. I think lines of code are important in certain areas of the software development process, and we're going to talk about that. And, and one of the things Go is trying to do is reduce the amount of code that we need in any given project, just to make it easier to manage, make it easier to maintain. And so we're going to be learning how is Go allowing us to minimize the amount of code we need for any given project that we're, that we're working on. Now another thing Go is trying to fix is this idea of creating these large abstractions in your code base. I get it, we need abstraction, we need decoupling, and I promise you we're going to be talking about that. But we want to focus here on thin layers of decoupling. We want to focus on, on, on thin layers of abstraction that are precise. And this is where Go is going to be a little different than some of those other languages that you've been working on. And that's going to help us again around our read, readability, our maintainability. So we're going to be talking about that stuff as well. Now this is a big one that's close to my heart. And, and what we really forgot, um, because of the way a lot of programming languages are designed, is that the hardware is the platform. That, if performance matters, and it's the hardware that matters, it's the hardware that executes instructions. And one of the nice things about this language is that Go's model is the hardware. It's not a virtual machine that's sitting between us and the hardware. That Go's model is the hardware. And that's going to really lend itself in our ability to be able to read code and write code like you never have before. So we're going to be talking about mechanical sympathy in this class with the idea that the hardware really is the platform. And last, maybe the biggest thing we talk about throughout the entire series here is that we forgot that every decision that we make comes with a cost. For me, engineering is about understanding the cost you're taking for the decisions that you're making. And if you're not really understanding the cost of your decisions, you're not programming, you're hacking. We like to use that word in the industry. And for me, it's a word that says that we don't really know what we're doing, we're just trying to get something done, and that's okay. I mean, there's a lot of times where we've got to prototype and hack things out. The problem isn't hacking in and of itself. The problem is that when we stop from our hack and we don't go back through now and start thinking about the engineering costs of the decisions that we made. So I'm going to be a big proponent of prototyping things first, hacking potentially first, but that's not where it ends. It's just the very beginning of our journey in building production level software. Um, there's two other things here as, you, as we watch this video that I want us to you know, be prepared for. One of those is that I really want you to start to d dive in internally about who you are as a software developer. What are your design philosophies? Do you agree with what Go is saying? Or do you agree with what Go is doing? And, and there are these two um, ideas around um, opening your mind here. And, and the idea is that technology changes quickly, but people's minds change slowly. I want you to think about that, right? Like our minds change slowly and, and, and I have the job over the next, I don't know what this is going to be, 10, 15, 20 hours to try to change your mind and move it towards this kind of union around the way Go thinks, the engineering around Go. Because it's easy to adopt new technology, but it is. It's hard to adopt new ways of thinking. And, and in some cases, the costs that you're taking today in other languages don't cost us so much in Go, 
but it's also the reverse. The things that don't cost you in other languages cost you pretty heavy here. And that's where this whole idea of a new way of thinking. So in some cases, I've got to kind of break you down and build you back up. And I'm going to try to do that as long as you follow with me. I really want you to take this journey from beginning to end with me so I could really walk you through the mechanics and the semantics and help you change your mind, hopefully, on, on some of the design philosophies that you have today. The whole point here of, this, uh, uh, of my class, really, the whole point of my class is this idea that we, we ask people to learn how to write before we teach them how to read. I mean, think about that for a second. Like, where else in any other industry do we ask people to sit down and start writing before they read? Even if you took a, a class, an English class at the university level. You know, that class, that writing class that you take at university is gonna have you doing a lot of reading. Because it's reading that teaches us style. It's reading that teaches us what we like and we don't like. And reading then allows you to be better writers. And so we're going to have exercises in this class. And, and I'm going to point them out to you as, as we go through the video. And I'm not telling you not to, to do these exercises. But at the same time, but I really want to focus on the time that we have together is to teach you how to read read code. I mean, I want you to look at some of these quotes that I have here under reading code. You know, Alan Kay. If most computer people lack understanding and knowledge, then what they will select will be lacking. Think about that. What they sele and, and, and I want almost every developer, in fact, not almost, I want every developer to have that quote in front of them day in and day out. Because you're making engineering decisions. And it's easy to fall back into the decisions that you're comfortable with. But then you're losing sight about the, the progress that we have. Maybe there's better techniques, and maybe there's better tech. Maybe there's something better out there. We don't take the time to look at it. This is what Alan Kay is saying. So this class is also about helping you understand that, that there are really maybe better ways to be writing that code in Go, May, ideas around readability and simplicity. And I, I want you to really kind of take in that what Alan, Alan is saying there. And I already showed you already what Tom Love said about that we're teaching people how to write before we teach them how to read. But maybe uh, Gerald here has one of the best quotes around this. Programming is, among other things, a kind of writing. And one way to learn how to write, right? One way to learn writing is to write. But in other forms, it's also about reading. I mean, look at what Gerard is saying there, right? And, and when we read examples of good and bad, that facilitates learning. And so that's what we're going to be doing. I'm going to be showing you code. We're going to be reading a lot of code. We're going to be learning how to find those smells in the code. And not just find them, but be able to articulate what it is that we don't like about that. All right. So a lot of what we're talking about in that smells and, and design philosophies and things like that will transfer into this idea of a mental model. But you know, we're really at a point today. We're, we're, we're at a point today in the industry where legacy code is really going to be a serious problem. Go knows this. The engineers around Go know this. And um, there's some great quotes here. You know, Peter, I love this quote. There are two kinds of software projects, those that fail and those that turn into legacy horrors. And, and what is he talking about? He's talking about projects fail when they don't get into production, right? We are being paid to put code in production. That's where we're solving our problems. Whatever our production environment is, that's what we're getting paid to do. So if a project doesn't get into production, it's failed. But if a project does get into production and, and we're not able to maintain it anymore, well, that's the legacy horror that we're talking about. And if you think about it right now, uh, we've got systems today running on AS400s, mainframes, that are all written in COBOL. And if you think about that even more, you know, the developers who are maintaining these systems today, they're about 65 years or older. They're all retiring. We have a real legacy crisis right now uh, that's about to hit our industry pretty hard. And I, and I, and I love finding that 25-year-old in the room because I'm always like, hey, if you want to really get rich over the next like 10 years, don't learn Go, learn COBOL, right? Because that's where the money's going to be. We're going to need these COBOL developers. Uh, but this is a serious thing. I, I don't want us as an industry writing code anymore um, that, that can't be maintained, right? Because even Chuck Moore just said that legacy software is an unappreciated problem. It's a serious problem, right? But it's unappreciated. And it's going to be the downfall of our civilization. Like, I don't want Hollywood anymore making movies about asteroids and earthquakes. We need a movie where like every legacy system out there written in COBOL 
has now failed and nobody knows how to deal with it because there isn't a single unit test. Like, like that's where we're at, okay? And, and you know, I don't want to be building software anymore that puts us in that same situation that we're in today. Uh, but again, uh, Gerald here, I think, has a, a, an interesting quote. And when you think about what he's saying here, right, few programmers would ever contradict that that the programs they're writing are going to be maintained by somebody else. I mean, that's what he's saying, right? Think about it, right? If I asked you right now, do you think that the software you're writing today that's in production is going to be maintained by you for the rest of your life? You're going to be like, uh, no, right? You know, somebody else is going to maintain this. Yet, if you think about it, we don't really architect and design software with that in mind. We don't architect software with the idea that somebody else has got to come in and, and take this over. And, and I think one of the, the things that I've been able to do for the last 30 years is, is understand that fairly, fairly early on and design an architect software that can be maintained. And, and, and I want to talk about these things throughout the class as well. I've got some production level software today that's 20 years old, still in production being maintained. Some that's a decade, again, still being maintained. And every once in a while when I meet a developer on those projects, they thank me. They're like, Bill, I, you know, thank you for, for building something that's been able to be maintained over this long haul. And it's because I knew early on that this wasn't a project that I wanted to kind of live and then die on. I wanted to be able to move on. And we want to talk about how we also do that throughout this class. But I think Sarah May says something really interesting here. And she says, we think awful code is written by awful devs, but in reality, in reality, it's written by reasonable devs under awful circumstances. And I think it's incredibly important to understand this because I'm sure all of us have looked at a code base or a function of some piece of code and was just like, what drugs was the developer on when they wrote this, right? And why are they not sharing them with us? Because it must have been good stuff, right? I know, we're laughing a little bit about that. But what we have to understand a lot of times as well is you might look at a piece of code that doesn't look right anymore. It just it smells bad. But you don't understand the constraints that the developer was on. You don't understand sometimes even the systems that software was written on that have now been ported to other systems that don't have those same constraints. So we all have to be very tolerant about that legacy code we're looking at and not judge people. but. But, but take for face value that you know, this engineer had to make this decision for some reason and, and we're going to either improve that code or at least be able to maintain it and, and keep that consistency. But we're all really moving towards, what I'm really trying to move towards is the idea of a mental model. And I'm going to be big and you're going to hear me talk about mental models quite a bit in this class. Because if you can't maintain a mental model of your code base, you're not going to be able to debug it, you're not going to be able to to, to grow it, you're not going to be able to have a team around it. This is mental models are so important. And Tom Love, who loves numbers, he works on very big projects with the Department of Defense. He he said this one time. He said, "Let's imagine a project is going to end up with a million lines of code or more." Right? He says that in the United States, the probability of that project being successful is about 50%. I mean, think about it. He's saying once a project gets to a million lines of code or more. The chance of this project not faltering, not being able to be maintained anymore, kind of failing, right, turning into legacy, it's about 50%. And, and, and why is Tom saying this? Well, let's go back to lines of code for a little bit. I, I know a lot of developers who don't, who don't want to look at that line of code number, but I, I think there's some important aspects of it. And one of the things that Tom kind of discovered is that if you look at a ream of copy paper, so you, you've all held a ream of copy paper before. Now, Tom says that's 10,000 lines of code, like 10,000 lines of code in a ream of copy paper. And he said that the average developer cannot maintain really more of a mental model beyond that 10,000 lines of code. And we're not talking about memorizing every line of code in that ream. What, what he's saying is if you know how that code works, you know the, the workflow of that code, you know where things are. If I asked you where something was, you'd be able to find it very, very quickly. And he says, once you get above 10,000 lines of code, it becomes a very difficult task for any individual developer. And so what we could identify, just based on the 10,000 line number, is the health of a project and the health of a team. And once your project gets beyond 10,000 lines of code, we're now what we're saying is we really need a second teammate on that code, right? And, and, and Go is also trying to help with this, right? I'm not saying that Go is going to try to stretch the 10,000 mental model number, no. What we're saying really is that we can do much more in 10,000 lines of code in Go that we could in other languages, 
right? So we don't necessarily have to grow our teams as fast. But uh, with other ideas around packaging in this, we could have large projects and large teams and be able to maintain it. So Go is very focused on this idea that if we can reduce the number of lines of code, you know, we can have better success overall with the projects that we're building. If you look at these two quotes from Brian Kernahan, you know, Brian says that the hardest bugs are when our mental model of the situation is just wrong because we, you can't see the problem at all. And, and then he says that, you know, everyone knows that debugging is twice as hard as writing code. So if you are as clever as you can be in the first place to write it, how are you ever going to debug it? And he's absolutely right, you know. And one of the things that I think is an industry we've, we've kind of hurt ourselves with is debuggers. We, we've become developers that rely so much on the debugger. And it's something that I want to get developers off of. It is a tool. It's a great tool maybe to develop a mental model of a code base. But if you're dependent on your debugger to always find problems, you're not making sure your mental models of the code base are clean. You're not making sure that you really understand how things work. Uh, because, you know, debuggers don't remove bugs. They just run them in slow motion, right? And we can't, we can't have this. Remember, if there's a problem in production, you're going to be going after your logs, your mental models of your code base, and, and how things work. And so what I want to do is make sure that uh, when you turn that debugger on, it's, it's your last resort, that, that you've validated that your logs are, are, are not helping. You've validated your mental models are not working. And now we've got to jump in the, de in the debugger. But I promise you that if you need the debugger, We've got some bigger problems. We're not just going to band-aid this thing. We're going to try to figure out where did our mental model of, that, of this code base break down? Where did our, our logs kind of break down to not help us? Because you're not going to detach a debugger in production. You're going to have your logs. You're going to have your mental model of your code base. And that has to be working for you during development. All right, so I want us to begin to start thinking, OK, on how we are going to be better developers. And I, and I want to leverage Go to teach us these ideas, okay, how to maintain these mental models, how to think a little differently than we have before. I'm going to break it down and I'm going to build you back up. And there's other things I want to talk about before we start looking at any code. But this is some of the base things I want you to start to think about and, and who you are as a developer and how we can all just be better developers and build better code. What's really interesting about our industry is that if you ask anybody, it does performance is performance important, right? Is it, is it your, your priority? A lot of people will say yes, right? And, and performance is important. I'm never going to say that. And Go understands it as well, right? We're trying to leverage the full CPU capacity of our machines. And I'm going to show you at some point how we do that in Go. But I think as an industry, sometimes we forget that productivity has always really mattered more. I mean, look at all of the languages that we have today. You know, we can talk about Ruby and PHP and even Java, C Sharp. I mean, these are languages really that were about being productive as a, as a first priority. And we can't lose that, right? The, the problem is anytime somebody said, hey, give me, a, I, I need to make something fast, the fallback was, well, then you need to be writing in C, worst case, assembly. So I think what Go has done, one of the, the cool things Go has done is it's given us a language where we can be productive, maintain a high level of productivity, yet, Get the performance that we need. And, and this is going to be important. This is, don't, you know, I don't want questions that ask me, can a Go program be faster than a C program? Can it be faster than a Java program? That, that's irrelevant to me. What's important is, can I write a Go program that's fast enough? And, and this is the attitude that we're going to have throughout this class, fast enough. And 99 out of 100 times, that version of that Go code you're writing is going to be fast enough out of the box. And when it's not, I'm going to show you how to use some of the tooling that we have to make it hopefully run fast enough for you. But there's some great industry quotes around this idea of productivity versus performance. And, and Nicholas Worth, back in 1987, we're talking over 30 years ago, over 30 years ago, Nicholas was already saying, the hope is that the progress in hardware will cure all software ills. Right? He's, he's saying in this quote that as an industry, what we were saying was, I don't have to worry about writing performant code because the hardware is going to come in and make it fast. And back then, back in the, in the late 80s there, we were getting new processors, what, every three to six months that were just making our code run faster. So we didn't have to really worry about optimizing anything that we were doing because we believed that the hardware would come in and just solve the problem. And that just created a, um, I guess, 
what's the word? You know, it, it created an atmosphere where we didn't really have to worry about writing, writing code around that, right? The hardware would do it. But if you think about it, that was over 30 years ago, over 30 years ago. And, and what's sad is that we're having the same conversation still today. I mean, look at, look at Henry's quote from 2015, right? The most amazing achievement of the computer software industry is this continuing cancellation of the steady and staggering gains made by the hardware industry. So think about it. Like, we are still, as an industry, keep putting the onus of performance on the hardware, and we design these languages, and we write code with that idea in mind. And what it's done is it's really kind of made hardware uh, stall out. We're going to talk about hardware in this class, but the hardware really hasn't changed in about 20 years. And here's Rick Hudson, who's one of the PhDs uh, on the language team that works on the garbage collector. He said this at, at GopherCon in 2015, the hardware folks will not put more cores into their hardware if the software is not going to use them, right? And this is a balancing act where we're both staring at each other in the face and we're hoping, right, we're hoping that at least one side can break through. And, and what Go is trying to do is say, hey, you know what, we've now designed a language that's going to take full advantage of the hardware that you've given us today, and hopefully that will give you enough reason to, to move us forward again. So Go, I think, is going to be really instrumental and has been instrumental in being able to leverage the hardware that we have today. But we're going to talk about the hardware, and we're going to see how, you know, where it's really been stuck for for the last 15, 20 years. But I think one of my most favorite quotes in this material is this quote here from Brian Kernahan. And he's talking about C. This was a, uh, uh, an answer to a question that was given to him back in 2000, right? Almost 20 years ago, he said this. And I, what I like about this quote is you can replace C with Go, and it, and it holds true because, because the machine is our model. And, and he says C, but let's replace that with Go is the best balance I've ever seen between power and expressiveness. You can do almost anything you want to do by programming fairly straightforwardly, and listen to what he's saying here 20 years ago, and have a very good mental model, mental model of what's going to happen on the machine. You can predict reasonably well how quickly it's going to run and understand what's going on. Those points are at least dear to my heart. I want them to be dear to your heart. What this class is about is about allowing you to be able to read code and go like you've, or just code in general, like you've never done before, to be able to have a mental model, to be able to predict reasonably well how it's going to run, and to be able to understand what's going on. This is a core, core mission of, uh, of Go's language, and this is something that I'm going to be teaching you throughout this class. What I want you to, to take back is that I, I think Go is really one of the first languages that stepped back and said, look, we need to have code that can run fast enough, that can take full advantage of the hardware. But at the same time, we've got to have that programmer productivity, because if we lose productivity, then the performance isn't going to matter. And this is what Go has done. It, struck, it has a, this balance, right? It strikes this balance between productivity and performance. And in this class, I'm going to show you that balance and show you how amazing it is that this language and the code that you're going to be writing, you can predict reasonably well how things are going to run and understand it. Another big problem we've had in our industry is when people are writing code, they're focusing on whether that code is going to perform well enough. And at that point, when you're writing code, if you're thinking about performance, you're guessing. And one thing that's great about Go, and one thing I want to teach, is that we do not guess. We never guess. When you're guessing, you're going to be wrong. And Go's got enough tooling where we don't have to guess about anything. And so when we're writing code, we don't want to focus on performance. What we want to focus on is correctness, because that's something that we don't have to guess about. And correctness is going to be around is there integrity? Is there readability? Is there simplicity in that code base? And this is going to be a matter of refactoring. So we really want to focus on correctness versus performance when we're deep down on that keyboard writing that code. These are the things we can look at when we're pair programming, when we're looking at PRs. And once you get a program working, then we can focus on is it fast enough? And I'm going to show you the tools uh, at some point in this video that allows us to not guess whether or not we have a performance issue or not. But there's some great quotes around this idea of correctness versus performance. And Wes Dyer has this great one, right? Make it correct. Make it clear. 
make it concise, and then make it fast in that order. And, and, and these are philosophies that I want us to be carrying on. I'm going to be talking about all of this stuff throughout the class. And JBD, who's a, an amazing engineer at Google, um, said this. She said, good engineering is, is less about finding the perfect solution and more about understanding the trade-offs and being able to explain to them. Remember what I said to you that hacking is when we're not thinking about the cost, right? And costs are about trade-offs. You have to understand that if we do this, it's going to cost us that. And if we do that, it's going to cost us this. And when we have engineering conversations, it's not about good or bad. It's about whether I agree or not with the costs you're taking for the things that, that you need. And this idea of a perfect solution also is really important, right? If I asked you to write a blog post, and I gave you one hour to write that blog post. In an hour, you would give me something back, and the very first thing out of your mouth would be, hey, Bill, uh, here's my first version of my blog post. It's raw, so just, just remember that when you review it. right? And what are you doing when you tell me, hey, this is a raw draft? right? Because the word draft's going to come out of your mouth. Hey, Bill, this is my first draft of the blog post. And what are you doing when you say that to me? You're, you're kind of getting into a, a protective mode. right? You're being defensive. You're trying to say, hey, Bill, this isn't perfect. And remember that when you read it. And this idea of us as software developers having to write perfect code all the time, it has to go out the door. And so moving forward, you can also hear me use this word draft. We're, we're drafting code. We're drafting code. And I, I want us to get into this idea that we're always drafting code, and then we're reviewing it, and we're revising it. We're refactoring it. And it gets to a point where the code is now at a place where it can be published, right? And I want us to take this idea, because if we can take this idea of drafting and not have this need to be perfect all the time, we're going to end up writing better code. But it does require our ability to add refactoring into the daily process of everything we do. You know, Al Ho said this, and there's some really nice things that he says in this quote. The correctness of the implementation is the most important concern, but there's no royal road. Look at what Al is saying. It involves diverse tasks, thinking of invariance. There, he's talking about those trade-offs again, the, the engineering costs. Wh which which costs are you taking for the benefits you need? Testing, testing and code reviews. Guess what? All of that requires our ability to be able to read code. If you want to write tests, you got to be able to read code. You got to have mental models of the code base. You got to know what that code's going to do. Code reviews, reading code. Remember I said that, you know, we're an industry where we ask people how to, to learn how to write before we teach them how to read yet. Everything we do that makes us better software developers, everything we do that makes us more productive, everything we do here around co being correct, right, versus that, that, that um, you know, optimizing for performance is always going to be really focused on our ability to read, read code. And I think Jason Fried here says something really cool here at the end. Problems can usually be solved with simple, mundane solutions. This means that there's no glamorous work, you don't get to show off your amazing skills, you build something that gets the job done, and you move on, okay? There's no oohs and there's no ahs. You get on with it. Look, you know, I'm a back-end developer, right? And when people ask me what I do, actually, when people ask me what I do for a living, I always say, hey, I, I build air conditioning. And they're like, what, what are you talking about, you build air conditioning? I go, yeah, yeah, I build air conditioning. As I said, we, we've been in this room for half an hour, right? Yeah, and I go, have you thought once about, about the air conditioner at all since you've been, you've been comfortable, right? Like, has the thought of the air, AC even entered your mind in the last, say, half an hour to an hour? And so I go, no, no. And I go, well, what happens if that thing shuts down? that thing shuts down, it's not going to matter what I'm saying to you. Your focus is going to move to the AC, and you're going to want to know one thing. How did it break, and who's coming to fix it, right? And you're going to want to know who that is. So that's what I mean by I build air conditioners. I build systems that run day in and day out, and nobody knows who I am. Because if somebody knows who I am, I have failed. That AC is broke, and now nothing else is getting done other than who's coming in to fix it. And, and this is the attitude I want you to have. You, you need, as a back-end engineer, to be building air conditioners. If you want the oohs and ahs, the oohs and ahs that Jason's talking about, then you'd be a front-end dev, right? That, that's the front-end dev, right? Showing off your work all the time. But I promise you, I mean, I couldn't be a front-end dev because I'd spend two weeks trying to build a screen, and as soon as I showed it to somebody, somebody's like, hey, I don't like this. Hey, I don't like that. Out of the box. And I'm like, ugh. Okay, so if you want the oohs and ahs, be a front-end dev. But if you're going to be a back-end dev, and this is what we're learning here in Go, then you really need to think about how am I going to build that air conditioner? How is the only people in this company that should know my name is my team? And that's it. And my stuff runs day in and day out 
So what we're really talking about here, and what we're going to be moving forward again, is that when we're writing code, we want to focus on the correctness of the code. That's going to be about integrity, readability, and simplicity. Those are things that we don't necessarily can have to guess about on the day in and day outs of writing that code. If you write a line of code and, and, and I ask you why, and you say, oh, because it's, it's going to perform faster, and it's not something you've done a million times, then you're guessing. We can't be guessing when we're writing code. So before we can jump into any code, Right, with this idea of optimizing for correctness, we have to kind of set some rules up on what that means. And I, I briefly talked about words like integrity, readability, and simplicity. And I want to dive a little bit deeper into what these words mean, at least for Go. Right? Some of these are buzzwords, and they can mean different things for different languages. So let's define what they mean for Go. And this is going to help us as we journey through our understanding of being about how to read code. So, Integrity is about being, becoming very serious about reliability. And there's, there's two driving factors behind uh, integrity. There's a micro level and a macro level. But before we could talk about that, let's think about any piece of code you've ever written before. Think about any piece of code you've ever written. It really only does three things. It allocates some memory. It reads that memory, and then it writes to that memory. Right? This is what we're doing all day. This is what our code is doing all day. It's reading and writing to memory and, and allocating it when necessary. And if we want to take it to another level, all you're really doing is reading and writing integers all day. I mean, if you're doing some machine learning AI stuff on GPUs, then you're reading and writing floating points all day. But you know, this machine that I have right here, like the processor is integer-based, right? Like, and this is why um, it's going to be so important to be you know, when we, we start talking about integers and things, that you know, using the right integer is always going to be important because this is a machine that's reading and writing integers all day long, right? And weird things happen. You're seeing me on your computer, and lights are flashing, and phones are buzzing, all, all because of that. At a micro level, what integrity means is that every one of those reads and every one of those writes that we're doing is accurate, consistent, and efficient. When we lose any of those three things, then we have an integrity issue. And unfortunately, when you have an integrity issue, if you can't recover, you've got to shut that software down. We all have stories of when a piece of software went rogue, integrity issues, and started corrupting things. There's also a macro level of integrity. And, and the idea of macro level integrity is the idea that every problem that we solve is a data problem. It's a data transformation problem. I call Go a data-oriented designed language, not object-oriented, but data-oriented. I'm going to show you that. And if you think about it, any problem you've ever solved is a data transformation problem. You get some data that comes in, we transform it, and it goes out. However it goes out is one way or the other. But this is what we're doing all day. And so the whole idea of data-oriented design is that if you don't understand the data, you do not understand the problem. And if you don't understand the problem, how can you write a single line of code to solve this problem? You can't. You know, we're all data scientists at the end of the day, regardless of whether we use formal machine learning models or not. We're all data scientists at the end of the day, and we gotta, we got to get that in our head. So at a macro level, what integrity means is that every function we write, right, which is in, in essence a data transformation, every data transformation we write also has to be accurate, consistent, and efficient. And if it's not, We've got integrity issues. So we've got to talk about things at, at a line of code in terms of readability. Eventually, we've got to talk about things at a function level around readability, because they both play into this idea of integrity. And I need you to, to put integrity first. Nothing can trump integrity. We see a piece of code that doesn't have integrity. You know, that code review, it has to stop. We've, we've got to fix it. Now, at a macro level, there's two things that we can kind of focus on early on in a code base around integrity. One is um, writing less code. Here comes lines of code again coming in, right? And the other is really handling errors. Because we're not worried about a program that is running perfectly when life is good. You know, as engineers, we have to worry about when life is bad. Let's talk about writing less code for, for one second. You know, there was a study done that, that analyzed code. And, and, and the study came up with the idea that for every 1,000 lines of code written, the average developer will produce anywhere from 15 to 50 bugs per 1,000 lines of code. So if we put ourselves in the bad developer bucket, which I want us all to do at all times, that basically means is that for every 20 lines of code that we write, put this in your head, for every 20 lines of code that you write, there's a bug introduced into your software whether you like it or not. 
all right? Whether it shows itself or not, it doesn't matter. It's there. So how can we add less bugs to our code? You write less code, right? Here it is, that lines of coding. And again, what is Go trying to do with this language? It is trying to, to minimize the amount of code we need to solve problems. Again, a part of that is so there's less bugs introduced in the code. I mean, just do the math, right? Um, and there's other ideas here also that you only should have the code you need for that version of that product. Having more code than you need also causes problems. You know, it, it leaves places for bugs to hide. It also starts to create situations where you have incomplete tests because you start not writing the tests you need because you've got all this extra code and you don't have time, right? And then eventually what happens is, as well, is you start walking away from your patterns and your frameworks and you start to hack code. All of these things happen when you're not maintaining a mental model of your code base. You're not re re revising or refactoring that code base. When you're not constantly in this idea that let's just have the minimal amount of code we need at any given time for any given version, and we'll keep that code clean. So all of these things are going to help with integrity. And it's something you're going to be doing day in and day out. I always tell people that if you worked for an entire day with me, you're probably going to spend 30% of your time writing new code and 70% of your time refactoring that code towards readability, integrity, and mental models. Now, on the error handling side, a lot of people don't like uh, the tediousness of error handling. But I always say that you know, there are certain things that need to be tedious. Security needs to be tedious, right? And I turn two-factor two auth author, um, authorization, right? As I was called, two-factor, off my phone because it was so tedious to get into my phone. I couldn't take it anymore. I was like, I'd rather be less secure, right? Like, the best security systems are tedious. Well, guess what? The bulk of what we do as engineers is about failure. It's not about success. And so your error handling needs to be a little tedious because we've got to constantly be thinking about what happens here if it fails, what happens here if it fails. So I don't have a problem with Go's error handling mechanics. I really don't. I know that they're looking at for a, a, a Go 2.0, a way of maybe making it a little less tedious. But I start to think about, are we optimizing for laziness now instead of optimizing for correctness? These things kind of scare me. Um, but there was, a, um, there was a study done where 48 critical failures that caused this software to kind of crash and burn were looked at. One of them is Redis. I mean, think about how much Redis is used in products throughout the planet, right? And Redis was part of this study. And, and what they discovered is out of those 48 critical failures, 92% of them, 92% could have been avoided with just better error handling, better error handling. So I think Go has it right with, with the idea of error handling because it's going to lend itself and help with a lot more integrity. And we'll talk about error handling when we get into the design aspects of this video. Um, but two great quotes here, one from uh, JBD again, right? Failure is expected. Failure is not an odd case. Design systems to help you identify failure. Design systems that can recover from failure. This is going to be a big mantra that we have in this, in this class uh, throughout the video. And Kelsey Hightower, uh, beautiful quote, product excellence. Product excellence is the difference between something that only works under certain conditions and something that only breaks under certain conditions. I mean, I mean, I want to explain it. I want you to think about what Kelsey is saying here. These are engineering uh, ideas, designs, and principles that we have to bring in with us day in and day out as we're writing code both at a micro level and architecturally at a macro level. All right, so that's integrity. We've got to take it seriously. If you don't take it seriously, I can tell you right now, you're not working for me. It's our number one priority. And the funny thing about integrity is, is that it's not free. Like, nothing is free. And usually, the cost of integrity is performance. We're going to lose a little bit of performance, maybe just nanoseconds of performance. But nothing is free. But we'll take that performance lost all day long if we have a system that's going to run in, run solid day in and day out. So that's integrity. That's number one. When we're doing code reviews, when we're reading code in this video, we're going to make sure that everything has a high level of integrity first. Now, after integrity, our next priority is readability. And readability has different meanings depending upon the language and the systems. I mean, overall, we can say that readability means that we have to structure our systems to be more comprehensible. But that's kind of subjective, right? And, and, and readability actually has uh, two aspects here. There's a, a, there's a subjective part to readability, and there is a measurable part of readability. The subjective part of readability 
really comes down to the idea that everybody on a team should be able to read code. We'll talk about that in a second. The other part of readability is that we do not hide the cost of code. We don't write code that hides the cost. And as an industry, we got into the habit of creating layers of generic abstraction which in the end of the day ends up hiding cost. And the worst, the worst thing that happens is we start building abstraction layers on top of our abstraction layers. We don't want to do that. Now, it's easy for me to say don't hide cost, but it's better if I can show you what I mean about not hiding cost. So I'm going to show you a little C++ code here. And this code is going to give us a good or better idea of what we mean by not hiding cost. And even though if you've never looked at C++ before, I promise you, you can read this code here. So if you look here in our C++ shell, uh, lines 7 through 14 is the definition of a new type called foo. Now this is an object-oriented programming language. So foo has been defined with a constructor, a destructor. It's got a move constructor, a copy constructor. And it also has an operator overload for the assignment operator. These are things we don't have in Go. I mean, Go could be considered an object-oriented programming language. I don't consider it that. Um, I've heard Rob Pike say it's a better object-oriented programming language. For me, it's a data-oriented language. And one of the reasons I say that is we don't have these features in the language like you have here in C++. So constructor, destructor, move, copy, uh, constructors, and our operator overload there. You see it all. There it is. Now, on line 16, what we have is a function named F1. And what F1 is doing, this is constructing an object, this is object-oriented programming, an object of type foo, and then returning a copy of that object back out. So object's getting constructed on line 17, and then it returns right there. You can see on 16 the, the definition returning that, a copy of that object back out. So I've shown you 18 lines of code. You see it all there. And we get to line 23 and 27. This is where this code gets interesting. See on line 23, we're calling the F1 function. It's constructing, like we saw, that object there. It's returning a copy back out. We're declaring a variable of type foo named foo1. And then on line 27, we call F1 again, reassigning back to the foo1 variable. So I've sh now shown you 27 lines of code. There it is. It's all there in front of you. And here is my question, right? Looking at all of this code, when this program runs, the question is, how many objects of type foo get created? If and when do those constructors, destructors, those move and copy operators, assignment operators, when do all of that code behind the scenes get executed for line 23 and 27? You see, and if you don't ask me what version of C++ we're using, you're already wrong because different versions of the C++ compiler are going to take different optimizations. This is what I mean by hiding code. When we look on line 23 or we look on line 27, we have absolutely no idea how this program is going to behave. We have no idea what code is going to execute behind these lines. This is hiding cost. Go doesn't have these constructors and destructors, doesn't have operator overloading, doesn't have these things because it hides cost. We want to be able to look at a line of code and predict reasonably well how that code's going to run, if it's even going to show up in a profiler or not. You can't do that with these features. Now, if I run this code here, you're going to see that for line 23, the compiler optimizes the copy away. So this time when we call def1, only one object is created or constructed, right? We see the constructor get called. But when we call f1 a second time on line 27, suddenly the, the object's constructed inside that function. A copy is returned back out. You start seeing all these other things happening. So think about it. The same function call in two different contexts created two different behaviors, two different costs. We cannot have code like this and then be able to maintain any mental model or any predictability, predictability on how this is going to run. All right, so this is what we mean about readability and not hiding costs. We don't want to hide the cost of things, and we're not going to do that in Go. But let's get back to the average developer. For me, the other part of readability is that the average developer on your team should have a full mental model of the code base, should know where everything is, should be able to debug it, should be able to program day in and day out and even teach that code base. The average developer should have a full mental model of your code base. And I want you to think about it. I mean, think about the team that you're working on right now. Ask yourself, am I the average developer on the products that we're working on? Do I have that full mental model of the code? Do I know where everything is? If there's a problem in production, can I debug it? If the answer is no, 
then I want you to say, am I, am I less than the average developer? And if I am, what am I doing to become average? What are my teammates doing to become average? If I'm above average, am I helping the team maintain that level of average? Am I writing clever code that's really hurting the team? Like that can be worse, right? And so I want you to always be evaluating yourself. Am I the average developer? And am I doing the things that are, that are right to keep the average developer on my current team? Um, at a point where they can maintain those mental models and maintain maintainability, right, of the code base. And when you're hiring people, I need you to ask, are we hiring somebody that's average, less than average, more than average? Or what are we doing to our team dynamics here around readability? Look, you put me on a team building business-based web APIs, I'm above average. I've got to make sure that I'm writing code that's in line with the team. You put me on a crypto team, I'm below average, right? I've got to come up. They can't dummy down the code, but they also got to help me come up and be average. So these are the things we mean about readability. And moving forward, we're going to be talking about mental models. We're talking about readability at a team level. When we talk about not hiding cost, we're talking about writing code that we can predict reasonably well at that line, at that function, um, what's, you know, and, and have that level of comprehension, not hiding costs. Now, the last thing here on our code reviews will be simplicity. Actually, right before we even talk about simplicity, this is a great co quote from Peter. I'm going to be bringing this quote up over and over again throughout the class. Making things easy to do is a false economy. Focus on making things easy to understand, and the rest will follow. This, to me, is huge. This is going to be embedded deep into everything we do. Don't make things easy to do. Make them easy to understand. And sometimes that means that we're going to have a little redundancy in a code base. Sometimes that means that things are going to be a little more tedious. But at the end of the day, it's not about your, your life when you're writing the code. It's, it's, it's about your life when the code is failing and you have to debug it. I want that to be our higher priority, right? So when, when the problems are occurring, we can reduce our stress levels by being able to maintain this code and fix it as opposed to trying to reduce stress levels when we're trying to write it, all right? This has all got to be about, about, again, handling the engineering problems when things are failing, not when things are good. Now, simplicity is last. And simplicity is last because it's something that you have to refactor into. You can't get to simplicity day one. And the funny thing is simplicity is kind of fighting readability. If readability is about not hiding cost, simplicity is about hiding complexity. I'm now using the word hiding. We said don't hide. Well, simplicity is about hiding complexity without losing readability. So if you start hiding complexity in, in a generic way and, and with general abstractions, and we lose readability, you can't have it. And this is why simplicity is not something you achieve day one. You achieve it through refactoring. We, look, you got to get something to work. Then we're going to do these code readability reviews. Once we've got code readability reviews in place and we feel like the code is comprehensible, now we can start asking questions about, well, how can we hide some of this complexity? This is a staged approach, right? And I hear people sometimes say, Bill, I don't have time to do this type of level of refactoring. Look, I'm telling you, you don't have time not to. Refactoring isn't something that you set a sprint for a week from now. It is something you're doing day in and day out. You get a piece of code working, we do code readability reviews, we clean up our comprehension of the code, we clean up our mental models of the code base, then we ask, how can we hide complexity without losing this readability? Now we can create some levels of decoupling. Now we can, we can do these things. And it's, it's a constant kind of flow of us doing this all day long. This is what we're going to get to. So as we now transition into start looking at code, remember that our focus is going to be integrity first, and what's the cost of integrity? Some performance. Readability next, you know, being able to make sure that code is comprehensible, not just by us, also by our team, and that we're not hiding cost. And then third, we get into refactoring towards simplicity, about hiding complexity. This is our priorities all the time. And even as we learn Go and go through the code base, these are going to be our priorities. I'm going to be bringing these things up over and over and over again. So now we're ready, our minds are framed, and we're ready to start looking at code. So a big part of this class is asking that question, if performance matters, then what matters to me as a Go developer? And we're going to be focusing on that throughout this class. Now, there's four top reasons why your software isn't running as fast as it otherwise could be. And we'll explain these things as we go on, but let's just list what they are now so when I bring them back up, you'll, have a, you'll already kind of know what I'm talking about. So number one is 
external latencies. External latencies are going to be performance depth. We're talking about system calls, waiting on things on the network. I mean, and we're talking about milliseconds of latency here. And we're going to talk later on in this video what a what time actually means so we can have a good reference point for it. But we're talking about milliseconds of latency most of the time when we talk about these external latencies. And, and this is why microservices drives me crazy a little bit because if you're using a microservice or you're jumping processes, let's say, to handle a request, right? I mean, you've already incurred milliseconds of latency on the response time. So I always want to be really careful when we start talking about microservices so early on in, a, in, a, in an architecture because the, the latency costs are pretty bad. Now, number two is going to be internal latency costs. Now, we're talking more about microseconds of latency. Uh, these are things that are happening internally in your app. These are things that we can definitely talk about over the next um, you know, hours that we're going to be spending together on this video. The external latencies we're not going to really talk about here, but the internal latencies we are. And two big parts of internal latencies that we'll end up talking about, one is the garbage collector and the internal latencies it's bringing. And we're going to be talking about when we get to multi-threaded software, synchronization, and orchestration. Uh, number three on the all-time list of why my software isn't as fast as it otherwise could be will be how we access data on the machine. Remember that the machine is our model. So how we access and store data can affect performance. I'll show you that as well. And then number four is going to be algorithm efficiencies. And algorithm efficiencies normally are not going to hurt us unless maybe we're in tight loops. And the machine is pretty fast today in executing instructions. We'll talk about some of that as well as we go on. So unless we're really talking about tight loops, I'll always add that algorithm efficiency to number four. In other words, I don't mind an algorithm to be a little less efficient. In other words, requiring a little bit more instructions to get the work done if uh, that code is more readable, right? Like, like readability has to be our higher priority in that case. So again, let's just go down this list and things we're going to be talking about. We're going to end up having, at, at our number one level, what's slowing our program down. That's going to be external latencies. We're talking about milliseconds, milliseconds of time on external latencies. Then we've got internal latencies. Now we're talking about microseconds of latency right there. Then we're going to be talking about how we access and store data. That could be anywhere from nanoseconds to even microseconds, depending on what we're doing. And then finally, algorithm efficiencies. That will be number four. And we'll be covering all of these things uh, as we move forward. Thank you.